attending this another seminar, the periodic seminar. Today we will have the honor to um, to hear from over for uh, from a review on uh, for of formal verification that already attended. And which is mainly about how to perform formal proof and all those stuff uh, for written systems. Hi, so as Patrick said, uh, today I'm going to give a really high level overview of what formal verification is and how can we benefit from it. I will not focus in particular aspects of uh, real-time systems, not in this one. I already promised Patrick that I'm going to give a specific talk on that subject. Uh, my goal here is basically to transmit some ideas on um, how, or what are the main differences between formal verification and the kind of verification that it is the current practice today, and what are the mathematical basis behind this. Not all of them, of course, otherwise we would have weeks to talk, but I'm going to try to give the best overview that I can. So that this doesn't get too much boring, okay, and you don't get hungry before the time to eat, I'm going to try to, to give two interactive uh, presentations on systems that are available and that can help us make formal verification. One of them will be an automated theorem prover, something which does all the work or tries to do all the work from, uh, for us. And the second one, a proof assistant. Okay, where we in fact build proofs interactively a bit in the way that we do in our papers but with further restrictions imposed by the systems. Okay. So I will try to keep everything within 45 minutes at most. So basically this is the outline. I will say more or less what is formal verification then provide you the background, basically mathematical and logical background which is behind this, this area. Then I will talk about runtime verification, then automated verification, but static one, and then about assisted or interactive verification. Okay? So let's start from the very basis. What are the current verification practices? Well, essentially, we have testing and simulation. Okay? They are quite good tools that we have available, but they are far from being complete. For instance, testing aims at finding bugs not showing that they don't exist in a system. Simulation is a, be, uh, a bit like that. I would say that it is more intuitive, okay? And allows us to refine our parameters in a more intelligible way, okay? Testing is more about random generation of cases within some spectrum that we define and then allowing for the soft supporting software to do all the tests. Anyway, we are always risking ourselves into not finding a corner case and when we deploy the system and make it run, it will work by some reason. Okay? So, what is the main uh, solution that we have for this particular problematic that we face today with complex systems? Well, the solution is basically to use strong mathematical systems, which gives us a rigorous and unambiguous language to specify the properties that we want to see implemented in the system, which allows also to design models, because usually we are not interested also only on general properties, we are interested in a particular model that we can formalize, for instance, or model in a state machine, okay? Most of our systems work like this, even if they run forever, okay? And besides these two, we also need inference systems. Inference systems are the tools provided by these mathematical uh, constructions that will, allow, that will allow us to build the proof step by step and ensuring that we don't make any mistake in the middle. Mistakes are very usual, of course, when we do pen and paper proofs. Okay? I will go here to the camera. Um, so this is essentially uh, what we have today. We have mainly testing and simulation, but we want something stronger. Something which allows us to build results and for no one to contest them. Okay? So, essentially, this is what I just told you about. We need mathematical reason to prove whatever we want to prove. We want to build proofs and we want them to be checkered. Okay? In useful time. Any of us can provide a huge theory, okay, that will 
that can take hundreds of years to verify. Even recently, a crazy Japanese guy developed its own branch of mathematics, some crazy stuff. I cannot detail my own. My brain doesn't go so far. And the main preoccupation of mathematicians, standard mathematicians, is that this paradigm is so different that they may not have time or enough resources to try to check if its new proposal is valid. So, in fact, we need tools. We need tools to help us on this. Okay? So, formal verification is very yes. useful on this point. It's mainly here. I would say that this is a strong point. If you use formal verification, you can apply these techniques at very early stages of development, rather than implementing the, the system and then doing tests, which are boring, expensive, and in the meantime, you cannot do anything with your, let's say, software. You are waiting for it to be tested to get more information. So, of course, we don't have only good news. In particular, to use formal verification in industry, you need uh, training. Of course, for us, academics will be not such a mess. We just have to take our time, learn these systems, and do our work. Industry doesn't allow that, mainly due to deadlines. Okay? Also, a lot of interesting problems are not decidable. Unfortunately, we have the outing problem all around. Okay? So we cannot use just easily any system, do our proofs, because we may risk, if we are not um, clever enough or detailed enough, to not see that we can encode the outing problem within our system and then if that is possible our system is definitely inconsistent so all the kinds of proofs that we do render to no. okay? and also a proof can take really too much time to be constructed for instance uh, during my PhD it's the only time I'm going to talk about it the goal was to implement in the proof of system that I'm going to show on how to use very easily the goal was to encode and implement an algorithm that shows that two regular expressions are equal. Okay? So, the algorithm itself can be implemented, for instance, in Python in, let's say, one day. Okay? It took me, well, I'm a bit dumb, in fact, but it took me four years to encode it and prove it in the market. I'm a bit dumb, but I would assume that French guys from India are not. But for them, it took also four years to do a similar problem. Okay? It's, it's quite hard because the, well, the reason is not the argument itself. If you do it in a paper, you'll understand it. The problem is that when you translate that into a particular form of a system and you use a tool to enforce your ideas, you will have to face the constraints imposed by the tool. And that can be a mess because you will have to change paradigm between uh, the pen and paper writing and the encoding in the system. It can, it can get really painful. Okay? For instance, in a, so, so, so a small example, in a proof system like COP, which I'm going to, to show, it, um, the, the kind of programs that you can encode there, they must be structurally terminating. This means that all programs must terminate within there. In the standard programming language, you are free to do whatever you want. You can do during complete programs. You just encode things, you can put there an infinite loop and it will run eventually for it. Okay? So these kind of problems uh, as I'm telling, uh, that I'm describing force you to encode, for instance, termination within a particular representation of, of the formal system which is uh, well known as uh, well-founded uh, induction meaning that you all, always have a finite chain between your input and your output and that forces the program to terminate. And that can take really a long, long time. So, just to give a bit more strength to this argument, let's look at two, some achievements so far. The first one, I would say, which re re revolutionized the, the idea of formal verification as a tool, was the four-color theorem in graph theory. The idea of this theorem is that you can paint any kind of map with just four colors, and ensuring that, uh, let's say, two countries that are uh, joined with each other do not, are not paint with, painted with the same color. Okay? This is a, a relatively old theorem for, whom, uh, for which there was a pen and paper proof which was too long. Mathematicians understood that they could not verify it, so a guy implemented an assembly program at the time 
to generate all the thousands of particular cases that need to be proved, but, well, it was implemented in assembly, so we cannot trust it. Eventually, uh, Georges Gontier appeared, yet another French guy, and proved this in code. And from that point on, you cannot do this in It was shared, okay, once and for all. And this has huge implications. For instance, in, constru in compound construction, you need coloring to assign registers to variables, okay? This means that now you can use this theorem without a hurry and implement it, considering that you are careful. And no one will contest that part. Okay? The second one, the second result, Fred Thompson, again, uh, mainly developed by Gontier, plus a team of, I think, seven or eight guys, top guys, in this uh, in the Microsoft Giant Lab, they were able to prove the Fred Thompson theorem. It's the first time that two volumes, two mathematical books, were fully encoded within a theorem prover and fully shared. Okay? For me to see the effort that is needed, the first simplified version of the paper took that many pages. Okay? So imagine you read a paper and say, okay, after I'm reading this 1,000 blah, blah, blah pages, me, I can uh, give you a proof that it is correct. No one accepts that. Okay? Then for me, you have this, this huge piece of art. Okay? This was developed by Xavier Leroy, I think Patrick would connect him, I'm not sure. The guy implemented a certified compiler. Okay? This means that all the assembly code generated by this compiler is correct. It corresponds to the I level or to the source level um, code that you write in C. Okay? This doesn't happen with GCC nor with LLV. You are not sure that it generates the actual uh, correct assembly code. Okay? This one ensures that. And it in fact gets, for instance, optimization levels very close to some of GCC. It is now being, um, this product is now, no, this, this uh, research is now being transformed into a product by INRIA and will be uh, sold, for instance, in, pre in principle or to Airbus and companies like that, which need correct. And then, uh, more, more to our area, this cell 4 certified kernel, okay? It was not developed using, using only a system. Basically, you pick up a detailed model of the microkernel, translate it into a functional programming language like Haskell, okay? Then translate it to a uh, theorem prover, Isabel, which I'm not going to talk about. Everything was proved there, then a functional program was extracted from there and then a very careful and uh, carefully checked implementation of C for the kernel was developed. So this is the close as you get for certified microkernels to the kernel test. Okay. And finally all the works that are done in formal verification as they have this huge advantage. Once they are done, you cannot contest them anymore. Okay? So now I'm going to give you some background. I'm not. I'm trying not to, to be too much detailed. This is going to be basic logic. Um, a lot of you have seen this during your bachelor's or some talks in conferences, whatever. So this is just to give an idea of on the underlying basis of formal verification. So let's start for the very basis. We have propositional logic. Okay, true statements, essentially. In propositional logic, basic, you have statements, and they are, they are independent of each other. For instance, the first one, it's, in this case, in fact, both of them are true, in my opinion. <laughs> but anyway, they are apart, okay? Uh, I would say that uh, a supporter from Benfica can say that the uh, first uh, and two, second, uh, two sentences are wrong. So usually what you do, you pass this to a, to a solver, which in the very basic case is a truth table, it, it generates the combination of all valuations and says, okay, is this formula satisfiable? Okay, meaning that do we have a valuation that makes this sentence true? Is it valid? Okay, is it true for all the possible valuations or is it completely inconsistent? Any kind of valuation that you give it, it will return false. Okay, but as we know, uh, generating uh, and using um, truth tables is an exponential problem, so we cannot vary it. One solution is to use, in fact, an inference system. Okay? An inference system, in particular for propositional logic, is this set of rules. Okay? You have elimination rules and you have introduction rules. Elimination rules means I have this formula, let's split it into smaller cases, try to prove them, 
and see if, what, if our argument is correct. Introduction is when you have the pieces and you want to join them together in larger, in larger um, <coughs> formulas. Okay? Just to give you an intuition, let's take a look at two derivations. Looking at this, we can immediately see the difference between formal verification and standard informal or it's too strong, but informal mathematics. In informal mathematics, you would give this argument with text. Someone can take a look at it and say, okay, man, I don't understand your English. I don't, I don't believe what you're saying. But here, you don't have this problem. As you see, everything is obtained from a particular rule and we, whose arguments are previous rules. It's self-contained. Okay? You cannot break it. Okay? So let me just try to give you an intuition, for instance, of this second uh, proof here. So the goal is to prove that uh, bunch of Greek letters with stupid symbols on the left. So this is an implication, meaning if left side is true, then we want to control that the right hand side is true. So what we do? Well, in standard proofs, we would assume the left side. Okay? So let's assume it. We assume it here. So if we assume that in line one, then we are left with the right hand side, which in turn is an implication itself. So we can assume the left hand side of the right hand side, and that's what we do in line two. Okay? Then what can we do? We can make another assumption to prove what we are interested in. So we assume that not C is true. If not C is true, then we can apply the well-known principle of modus ponens. If you have an implication and if you have the left side of the implication, you can conclude the right side of the implication. And that's what happens here in line 3. This is called, in this particular system, the elimination of the implication, but usually it's called in <coughs> as modus ponens, and probably most of you have, have heard of this. Okay? But, if you obtain this with the same rule, you can obtain the negation of this. So you can conclude that it is false. Okay? And if from not C you conclude false, then you can negate not C. Okay? And if you have a double impl implication, then you can get the formula itself. So basically what you did is co you concluded from this hypothesis, this conclusion. And then you can construct the impl implication back. Meaning that if I assume this, I can conclude this. And before that, you assume that one on top. Then, if I assume this, and if I assume this, I can conclude this. Okay? And then you get the result. By the way, uh, <coughs> here there are more surrounding parentheses because we assume by default an association to the root. Okay? And this is essentially what is behind formal verification. <coughs> okay? It's to make this kind of process. Ideally, using a tool, not Android. Another uh, formal logic that is very important, in particular for real-time systems, is the notion of model logics. Model logics enrich propositional logics by giving particular notions of what is to be true or not. Here, you don't rely only on true statements. Basically, what you have in this kind of logics, it's a graph where the nodes have their own truth tables, meaning that the value of a variable, a propositional variable, may change depending on the state that you are. And this is basically what we need in computation when we see our system as a state transition system. Importantly, operator, our important operators are the next state, meaning that we're trying to check if phi is true in the next uh, state, or Psi, psi is true until we reach the truth value of t. Okay? And from this true, we can generate two important notions that are fundamental, for instance, for analyzing real-time systems. Because we are always interested in having safety. Is it true that in the future, phi will hold? This means that we don't care about what is here in the left side of the until, but we want to know that phi will eventually hold in the future. And also, we want liveness. It is global true, globally true that phi holds. This means that it is false that in the future we will find an evidence that the negation of phi holds. Okay? Let's uh, 
before showing you an example, it is important to understand that this is the very basis of model chain. Perhaps the most uh, applied technique of formal verification in the area of real-time systems so far. Model checking arises, in fact, from the verification of hardware, where you have a fixed number of computational states. Okay. In software, this becomes really com complicated because you can have programmers that enjoy to have variables and uh, messy behavior in the middle of code. And this means that those messy code, that messy code must take into, be taken into consideration in the old such space of the program. But let's take a look at quickly at an example. Okay? On top we have the intuition of what these operators mean. Okay? Next state, A until B, future A, G A. And here we have a particular state machine. Okay? And two conditions that hold. In fact, it is global true, globally true that the proposition A holds. If you look at the three states, A is there. Okay? And it is also globally true that if not B is true, then it is globally true that A and not B holds. Why is this true? Well, I think that everybody knows that if the left side of the equation is false, then we can conclude anything. Okay? So, let's take a look. Not B here is false. Then we can conclude this. The same here, okay, and the same here. So this is the essence uh, of, of model checking. Basically, what you do, uh, you pick your system, you create an abstraction from it in the form of a state machine, and then you specify those properties and try to verify them automatically with some tool. Okay, it has been quite successful, but it faces one problem. Once again, state exposure. Now, first order logic. So far we have looked into propositions, okay? Full sentences to which we give a symbol and we say, is it true or not? This is clearly much stronger. First order logic doesn't consider propositions as atomic uh, values. Here we consider domains, okay? We have predicates, we have variables, we have functions, okay? If you already programmed at some point, in Prolog, this is a theory which is beneath it. Okay? You have universal codification, you have existential codification, and then you have, once again, the inference system. Okay? And let's take a quick look at two, some derivations. The principle is exactly the same as um, we've seen previously with uh, propositional logic. The difference is that now we have to deal with quantifiers and predicates and also variables. So let's take a look at the left side, which is relatively more simple. So we want to prove the statement above. Once again, we can assume the left side of the, of the thing that we want to prove. Since we have a universal quantifier, we can assume some variable v which will replace x. So, we have P of V implies Q of V. From the second line, we can use the same variable to associate predicate P. By the elimination of the implication, we can get Q. Okay? And from the generalization rule, which is the for all introduction, we can conclude that for all X, Q of X is true. Okay? Because we concluded that Q V holds for any kind of V. Yet again, let me reinforce this. We do this all the time in our papers and in our arguments. We simply don't use symbols as this. Also, <clears throat> this kind of logic is in the place of most automated theory provers. The goal of our, how these provers work to handle most, uh, more, more uh, uh, let's say, difficult or complex scenarios is that we enrich the previous rules that I've presented with specific theories, for instance, piano arithmetics, which is a representation of natural numbers, where a natural number can be either a zero or a finite sequence of successors of zero, right? Or we can use uh, floating point arithmetics. It is assignable for a particular case. So we can enrich that with the axioms, we, we add new rules, and then it goes all around in the same deductive engine. And then finally, we have higher order law. This is uh, quite a, a nasty subject and we have to know a lot of 
functional programming, type theory, model theory, crazy stuff that French guys and American guys love it. And also that's from everyone. Um, what is essential to get from here is that in this kind of logics, programming and proving is the same thing. Okay? It's in fact the same thing. You can see a theorem as a type and the proof of that theorem, the program that has exactly that type. This is clearly not conventional in standard programming languages. I'm going to show you in the end of the presentation the top proof system which uh, <coughs> enables exactly this kind of reasoning. There are a lot of uh, constructive logics that work off on this paradigm. You have higher order logic, HOL. You have couples of, of constructions, which is in the base of, um, of Koch. And Patrick knows the mountain of this crazy stuff. And then you have Martin Love's type theory, which is basically the, the, main, uh, the, the equivalent, almost equivalent theory to couples of constructions that this in the essence of several other uh, theorem works. So, now I'm going to talk about uh, the different approaches that you have towards verification. I'm going to start with runtime verification. Okay? This is the area where I'm currently working here in the lab, together with Andre, together with Geoffrey and also with uh, Luis Pino. Andre already made a presentation about this, so I'm going to be short, but However, I promise you that I will give a uh, complete talk only about this and apply this to uh, the verification of our real-time systems. So, <clears throat> in the base of runtime verification, we have runtime monitoring. A well-known technique can be implemented or supported either by hardware or software components. With hardware, you basically don't impose overhead of the system, but you are limited because uh, cameras, uh, because <coughs> You, it's not so easy to modify hardware rather than uh, not easy to modify software. Okay? But the problem with monitoring is that it is usually designed in an adult way, just to catch that particular kind of problem. Okay? And also, it doesn't give any kind of evidence or doesn't come with some with evidence of correctness. By this I mean the guys that implement the monitors don't care that much if the monitors are correct or not. They assume that. Well, during the execution time of the program, if the monitor is not correct, it can imply that your system is not being correctly observed and you can get into an inconsistent state without knowing it. Okay? And also, most of the monitors are designed, or up to now, were designed to log um, behavior of the program for um, a posteriori analysis. Okay? And the final problem, or the big problem of this, of this uh, approach, is to introduce overhead if you use the software approach. Right? So, monitoring is essentially the base of runtime verification. Why? Because the idea of runtime verification is that we generate monitors, but in a clever way. Instead of thinking that we are great programmers and that we are going to solve the, pro the, the problem, we do pick up some of those formal methods okay, and generate the corresponding code. This means that the generation, or the code that we need to generate monitors will be, in principle, much smaller and much more robust than the one we could read, write in an adult. This is the, you know, the, the main motivation. In general, from the perspective of the formal verification community, um, runtime verification, which just emerged like 10 years ago, is a discipline of its own. It is a lightweight verification that technique that, of course, doesn't provide full coverage. It just analyzes the actual execution of the system. It does not require a level of abstractions like we've seen for model checking. It can handle true data, so we can go to that detail. This means that we can enrich existing formal, uh, formal systems or formal logics with particular details of the scenario we are working on. And <coughs> monitors can be made very efficient because they are usually uh, assume the form of automata and automata can be um, minimized and let's say manipulated so that it fits in very small amounts of memory and it's very efficient. Also, runtime verification is kind of the ideal partner for static verification. What you cannot do with static verification, let's put a monitor there, generated in a correct way, and we have basically complete, complete uh, verification. 
And as I told you, this is just an overview of formal amplification. I will give in the future, I hope, a talk just about this subject. So, <clears throat> on top of amplification, this is, let's say, the Eldorado of uh, guys which do verification. This is a static verification perspective where you have a tool to which you give proof obligations, what you want to prove, and the guy says, okay, yes or no, and it here is a here is proof. You can check it, don't worry. You have essentially two kinds. You have satisfiability solvers and satisfiability model of theories solvers. The left one <coughs> is essentially picking up the theories that are presented in the beginning of the talk and build a program to solve it. The second one is the part where I told you that we can enrich first order logic with particular theories and have a tool to generate this. So, theories of interest are quality. You have bit vectors which allow you to reason in particular with integer, integer numbers and floating point numbers. You have nonlinear linear arithmetics. You have particular data, data types like records, arrays, whatever. And among uh, a lot of other theories, there is this, this SMT lib group of interest, which basically proposes new theories to be added to provers so that they can help on proving properties of programs. This is clearly more directed to the source level programs. Famous provers, perhaps the most famous one is Z3, and well, it's written by Microsoft. Incredible, huh? So they have the best theory prover to avoid bugs and they still promote bugs in the code. Then you have out there flow. Then you have CVC3 and you have the ISIS. I would say that these two are the most powerful ones and the most used ones <coughs> So let us try to see one in practice. Okay? And that one is going to be Z3. Z3 has a very nice uh, web interface. And a very nice guy. Here, they don't care that much about theory. They just want to promote the system. How we can use uh, an automatic theory improver to prove something that you are interested in. So, let's say, start here with some simple stuff. Let's go to propositional logic. Okay? So, you define three variables P, Q, e, and R. These are Boolean, meaning that they are propositions. And then we want to define this, this conjecture over there. Let's just see. What is this? We can look, I would expect it to look. Okay, it's loaded. Now we can click the play. And it will say something, I suppose. Okay, it says that it is not satisfiable. Okay? What does it mean? Well, it means that the conjecture is valid. Note that we have asserted that we wanted to prove the negation of the conjecture. If the negation is unsatisfiable, then we don't find the counterexample, meaning that the conjecture itself is true, it's valid. You have a universal portion. This is for particular case of Boolean logic, okay? But think of the utility of these tools from the following perspective. You have a problem, right? In that, instead of addressing the problem using just text and informal arguments or even mathematical arguments, why not try to encode this in some kind of logic? in which then you can deploy to a system and check if it is true or not. Depending on the program, it can save you a lot of time and give you a definite answer, right? This is essentially the motivation. So we can go then a bit lower and then try to see if this guy can solve these equations. Usually we rely on MATLAB, Maple, or other mathematical programming, concerning programming systems resolve this kind of equations. But we can in fact use a satisfiability model theory program to do this. And then it gives you the answer. If you define B as 0, C as 0, E as 0, .0, 0 because these ones are real, and you define A as 10, you will have a solution for your equation. Okay? And this is online free for everyone. Microsoft doesn't charge this part. At least one. And then you have a lot more theories to handle. I will not talk about them here. Okay. I'm going to forward to show you how to use an <coughs> interactive theory improver. But keep in mind that you can use this at some point. So let's continue here. Now we would go to interactive verification. Mm -hmm. 
your uh, transformation up to a point that you trust on it, that you can pass to other guys, or that even some crazy guy can encode it in a theory prover, show that it is correct, and then you have all the system, or all the, the, the workflow of the system done. It is a bit harder, let's say, to say if it is possible to implement all of this in a row or not. It's just a matter of trying out, and as I showed in the beginning, these projects usually take really long time. The thing is that once it is done, it's done once and for all. No one can contest it. This is the big advantage. Okay? But about the, the list stuff I'm going to show you just next. Not about insertion and deletion, but basically about what it, how do we prove that certain algorithm is correct. Okay. So, interactive verification, I could show you the next example, the next slide, but okay, so let's see it again in practice. So, here is the beast. This is the contour system. This is perhaps the most expressive theory prover that you can have. All, or all except one of the results that I showed in the beginning of the presentation were implemented in the, within this system or variants of this system. Here I'm going to try to give you an intuition on how you build proofs and how these proofs are in fact objects that can be checked. Okay? So here I'm going to talk about lists from a functional uh, programming language point of view, but look them as linked lists. Okay? You just know, you just need to know uh, how you can construct a list, how you can append a list, essentially. Nothing more. So I will start. These, these first instructions here are basically parameters for the proof to go in a much easier way. Oh, in the like, new version it is deprecated. Very nice. Okay, so let's take a definition of a list, which is going to be our prime object of reason. So, a list can be defined inductively or recursively with two cases. Either you have the empty list, or you have an operator, here called cons, that takes an element of a given type, a list of elements of that type, and returns a new list. Here I'm talking about single type lists. You cannot have, let's say, uh, in COP, not at this level, you can in fact do it, but it's much more complicated to have, let's say, um, non-homogeneous lists, where you have elements of type integer, blah, 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 like you have in Python. Okay? But if you think that you go for uh, A in the job or blah, 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 then you cannot have that unless you wrap that those types in a particular other type. So this is the definition of a list. We are going to reason about this object. Okay? Since this, is, since this has this has two cases and it is defined as an inductive type, this is a in fact a type, you can use the strength of induction over this. Induction doesn't apply clearly only to natural numbers. It applies to any kind of uh, let's say data types that you can define by cases and by recursion. Right? So this is what we are going to reason about. Now we are going to define some notation to reason our, our reason. We are going to define that to columns to say that we are going to add an element to the top of a list. So let's define this list composed of only two elements, two and three. And let's see if it is true that it is constructed. Yep, it is true. You have two followed by three followed by the empty list, meaning that you have only two elements. And you can define more of this. Now, let's start a general theorem about lists. It is obvious that an empty list must be different from a list with one element. Okay? So how do we prove this in COP? Essentially, we define the specification of it. We say that for all A which has a type set, and this means that it is a computational type, any type, this is a polymorphic definition, and for each x of type A, and for each L, which is a list of type A, we want to prove that the empty list is different from x followed by some list L. Here we are quantifying universally, and bear in mind that in COG you are always targeting, targeting validity. You don't want to show if something is satisfied by some valuation. You want to show that these are proofs. In fact, these are uh, valid, that these are theorems. Okay? So let's start with it. Of course, I will not give the full details of these instructions over there, which we call tactics, proof tactics, the same kind of idea that we do when, uh, that we use when we are doing pen and paper proofs. Okay? So let's start the proof. 
And the first thing that we have to do, it's a bit similar to what I've shown you in the, the two examples of propositional and first order logic. We have to push our assumptions to the context of the proof. So we are going to introduce A, X, and L into the context of our proof. Now, we have somehow instantiated our universal quantified objects by particular ones. But we know that this can represent any kind of thing because they were previously quantified by four. Then, if we have a difference, uh, or, or let's say yes, a difference, we can push the equality to the context and keep the result that we want to prove as the false. Now, the proof goes as, if I assume that the empty list is equal to some list with one element, then I have to reach a inconsistency, right? How we do this? Well, COG provides particular tactics to solve this kind of stuff. As we are dealing with inductive types, which are also known as algebraic types, this, this means that the types are injective. They must be necessarily different if the constructors are different, okay? And if I go here and say print list once again, we have two constructors, the nil and the cons. And by definition, this must be different. So our proof of false will be obtained exactly from here, okay? We use the discriminate tactic, which is implemented within the system, and whose goal is to show or to prove false arguments exactly from different constructors which are assumed to be equal. So if I do this, it will say, okay, no, Lord, suppose we have proved our theorem. But what is in fact the mathematical proof that results from us to apply these tactics over here? We can see it. It's not beautiful at all and not comprehensive. This is a mathematical proof that corresponds to our reasoning principles. As I told you before, in this kind of systems, proofs and problems can be seen as the same kind of objects. So this is either, this can be seen either as a program, because we have a function with arguments, okay, and we have, for instance, there a pattern matching, but it is also a proof. And this is the essence of um, COG and, and uh, related systems. Look there, we have some egg underscore int, nil, blah, blah, blah. This is an induction principle, okay? Which is beneath the discriminate tactic. And I can show you how an induction principle is represented in God. It's essentially this. It's only a sec. And I cannot give you a complete explanation on how this works in the time that is left. Okay? But it is, uh, well, you don't need to understand it. Essentially, assume that you have induction and it was well implemented. And let's continue. Now we use our key ID to say, okay, the proof is done, and then it defines that the theorem as a proof that is now in the context of the theorem proof itself. Now, as I told you, we can define, uh, we can prove things, but we can also define functions. Let's define a function tail that picks a list and returns the same list except the first element. Okay, for that, we can do this. We can take, again, one polymorphic list and match over its structure. If it's an empty list, then we return the empty list. If it is a list with an A at the, at the head, we just return the rest of the list, right? Well, then, with this definition, we can try to go further and, well, let's take for now in consideration this, this uh, this definition and see how we can use it to prove that if two, two lists are equal, then either their heads are the same or their bodies are the same or their tails are the same. So here we want to prove that the rest of, or the tails of the list are the same if they are assumed to be the same with, um, <clears throat> if they are assumed to have two different things. Different so once again, let's, let's introduce this stuff. Okay, let's put this in hypothesis. And then what we want to do? Basically, let's take a look. We have L there, and we have the definition of tail. We know that tail returns the given a list with one element at the end, it returns only the rest of, the, of that list. So, we, in the conclusion, we can transform L into a call to tail with the A at the head. This is what is 
particular metatic does. We just transform L into a call to the tail of AL. We know that tail of AL will return L, so we keep exactly the same equivalence. But now we have on our hypothesis the hypothesis H. And it is an equality. So within the call of tail, we can rewrite AL by BM. That's the next step. Okay. And now we are basically up to the end of the proof. We know that tail will only return M, so we will have the equality M equals M. And then we know that this is true by reflexivity, and not check this equal to return. And it's done. We have another proof there. And what, yet again, we can take a look at the proof. Although, the, let's say, the specification of the proof is a bit more complicated than the previous one, the proof itself is small. But it includes a lot of information. Okay? <coughs> now, we can do similar stuff for the add definition. Uh, the add basically takes two arguments, uh, except uh, besides the type of elements of the list. It takes this x, which is a default um, argument, meaning that if we take as an argument of the empty list, we always return the return is the, the default form. Right? So, now let's go and try to do the, let's say, dual uh, theorem of the previous one. Now we are interested in showing that A is equal to B if we know that those two lists have A and B as heads. And the principle is exactly the Okay, it's the same. So, you introduce it once again, and now you just replace A with the call to the head. Now we will write our object, our hypothesis once again. We reduce add, and then we have the same equivalence. Okay? And this is essentially all the way the, the, how we can do this stuff. Now we can define a pen into lists, and we can reason a bit about what is the append. Okay? If we have lists L to 3 and lists L uh, 1 to 3, okay? this means that we will return. The, the, the call to this compute, which is in fact evaluation, will return the list 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. And let's check if it is true. Yes, it is true. It does computation. And now we can have another, another theorem that reason about the properties of this. For instance, show, showing that if we append a, a, an empty list to some list, then we will have, we have that list. And this is just as simple as introducing this, simplifying and showing that it is correct. And now, we have the other way around. Appending at the list to the end of an existing list. This cannot be done using simple, let's say, simple computation. Now, we need induction. We need to reason about the structure of L. Why? Because the append is defined on the left side. Okay? If we take a look at the append once again here, we know that if the list is empty, it will return M. But there we have the things in the, in the symmetric way. So we have to reason about this. And now we reason, so we put A and L in our hypothesis, and now we say, okay, let's do induction over the list. And induction will give you two cases. The base case, where L is replaced by the empty list, and the step case, where L is represented by adding a symbol to the top or to the head of the list. Here it's quite simple, we just simplify and we'll get m to list about equals to m to list. Here we basically do the same, and this same is saying that then we associate to the right, meaning that now we'll have a between brackets l plus 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 nil. Okay. And now we can rewrite our hypothesis, the IHL, and we will have the same. Right? And this is basically all about it. Now I just give you, want to give you a very fast way an idea on how you can show that in such and so it is in fact the correct algorithm for some lists. First we have to define an order over natural numbers, and this is the let's say computational or a function that determines if m is less or equal to m. Okay. Let's just check if it is true. Um, yes, we can do that. Just do this thing because I want to show you that the 
there is also, let's say, a logical way to represent this, not combinational. So let's first evaluate and see if three is like less or equal than, than four. I hope it keeps true. Yes, it is true. Then, here we gave uh, um, a computational interpretation. We can give a logical one, which comes built in with God, which is this stuff over here. Like we've defined at least, we can define predicates. The less or equal predicate can be defined in two cases. Either you have n less or equal than itself, which is basically reflexivity, or if you know that n is less or equal than n, then n will be less or equal than the successor, the next element after n. And we can give a proof of 3 less or equal than 4 in a logical way rather than a computational way. How do we do it? We want to apply the constructor of the type, that second case to go from 3 less or equal to 4 to 3 less or equal to 3, and then apply the, the first constructor saying that n is less or equal to itself. So, if we apply the constructor, we get 3 less or equal to 3, and we apply again, we know that it is true by the definition of the type, and we can see the proof. Okay? This is simply the application of the two cases that we find. This is for very simple arithmetic. Believe me that there are guys which are doing really crazy stuff. So now we can see if that is false, that 4 is less or equal than 3. And now we continue to describe the implementation of insertion sort. First, we will use some axioms. I don't want to do the proofs for this, so we can introduce axioms. But be aware, in these systems, if you introduce an, an axiom, you must be really sure that it will not break your logic. Usually what happens if you put some um, axiom which is not consistent with your logic, the result is that you can derive false from your own development. And, okay, it's nice because from false you can conclude everything, but it will not be you. It's just uh, proof by inconsistency and stupid inconsistency. So let's go and do the insertion sort. First, for that we build the function that inserts an element and essentially says if you are trying to insert n in an empty list, then you get the list with just n. And if you are trying to insert n in some n s prime list, then you first have to check if n is smaller or equal than n. If so, you put n at the head. Otherwise, you let the current head and recurse on the rest of the list. Let's see if we can insert 3 between 2 and 4 in this next uh, list. Oh, yeah. Okay. And then we just need to define the sorting algorithm ourselves. And how we do it? Basically, sort, if it takes, if you want to sort uh, an empty list, then you already have it sorted. And if you want to insert, uh, sort a list with a head n followed by n s prime, then you have to try to insert n within the, the sorted list m s prime, which is obtained by calling sort over it. And once again, here is the function. Okay. Let's see if we are able to sort this list, the next one. And indeed, we are here with a sort list, completely sort. Now it comes the most difficult part, is to show that sort is in fact a sorting algorithm. For that, we have to define a predicate that determines what is a list to be sorted. Here we are going to define it as a function so that we have computation rather than uh, logical reasoning which is easier to explain and faster. So, <clears throat> what certain says is that if you have the empty list, then it is true that the list is sorted. Otherwise, A followed by N is sorted if N is sorted and A is smaller or equal than the head of N. Now, for helping, we just use this axiom, saying that for any two naturals, you can compare them in a total order. Then, <clears throat> we have this second auxiliary dilemma that shows that our computational version of less or equal implies, in fact, the logical version. And I will go quite fast over it. And then, we also need an extra lemma to reason about heads of lists. Okay. Either you have the head equal to the value of inserting n in the list, or your head of the list is the head of what remains in l, and not n, in the case where n and n are the same. 
So once again, let's go through it. And we have this lemma proof. And now we reach, let's say, the principal lemma of this development. What we want to show is that L, if L is a sort of um, list, then inserting a new element using our insertion sort will make the resulting list uh, sorted again. So we have an invariant over the property of inserting a new value on a list. This is quite large proof, I uh, will try to explain it. So essentially we have to introduce our two arguments and then we have to reason by induction on the, the um, structure of L. If we do so, we'll get once again two cases, the first one for the empty list and the second one for inserting a value on the empty list. The first one is quite uh, fast, you just put your hypothesis in the context, simplify the call to insert, which says, okay, do I have true and n is equal to n, and both of them are trivially true. So, basically, we split this conjunction in two cases, and we apply a tactic called alpha, which solves this, this trivial threat. Okay? And the first case is proof. Then, we need to reason about uh, the suddenness of having, adding a new element to a list for which we already know that it has a head of value A. So basically we insert once again, here in the context, we simplify this, and then we have to reason about n and a, and n being less or equal than a, which will determine if we put the new element at the head or in the body of the list. So let's also simplify h, so that we get two cases, which come from a definition of sorter. Now we know that l is a sorted list, and that a is less or equal than the head of the list l. What we have to do, we have to split also our hypothesis H so that we can use it and then we have to reason about the less than or equal uh, relation between N and A and that is done by case analysis which also provides us a tactic So now we are assuming we have two cases either N is smaller or equal than A or the other way around Now we introduce this new hypothesis here we simplify the result, okay? We split the result because we have two conjunctions, so we need to split them. Look, sorted L is already in our hypothesis, so we can use it. And the same happens with A less or equal than A R. Okay? And now we just have to prove that N is less or equal than A. For that, we will apply one of the other axioms that transforms this logical less or equal into the computational version, which we already have in the hypothesis. And then we can use once again our hypothesis and show that this is true. We now continue to the old case. Okay? Now we know that n is not less or equal than, than a. We simplify the result once again, we split. We apply our hypothesis H, uh, IHL, which says that well, we match the tails basically of the implication with our conclusion so that we need just to prove that sort of L is true. If we do that, then we just need to prove that L is sorted, which is already an hypothesis. Okay? And then we have to reason about the, particulars, the, the particular properties of the app of that list. For that, we can use this uh, intermediate lemma over here, which gives you case analysis on the properties of ads when you have an insertion of a list. Okay? So basically, we destruct destruct, it's not destructing, it's basically we will analyze both cases and instantiate the values to it so we will have two hypotheses H1 and H2 which will give us two different cases now we have again two different cases the first where we have that A insert NL is equal to N and the other way, the other case so here basically what we want to do we know that the right hand side of the less than equal um, <coughs> Uh, relation is already on the hypothesis and that it rewrites to n. So we can use that. Let's rewrite that. Let's rewrite this. And then we want to apply this other lemma that will say exactly the hypothesis and a. Right? Well, once again we have this other hypothesis and we finish. Now we are left with our last case. For, for proving this, let's go. 
we just rewrite the hypothesis U. Okay? And then we know we already have our what we want to prove in our hypothesis, and it is done. Okay? I can give you an idea of how long this proof goes in terms of its representation, and it is this. Once again, it can be checked. Even for humans. Humans can check this. Uh, I probably there are two in the world, I believe, Christine Paula and Bruno Bartas, but well those are crazy guys. Usually we don't forward these proofs to them, otherwise we will be keep. But we can do it if we know the rules. Okay? And then we go to our final proof and saying that it is always true that sorting a list is sorted. Returns a sorted list. Okay, so this is just a matter of inducting over the list, simplifying it, and applying the correct argument. Yeah, this, what I've shown you is a very small development. It was quite boring, I can see in your faces. Okay? But let me just give you my final motivation from this. Cockes particle is a very particular uh, property here. You can, in fact, extract no smells about the uh, You can extract a correct program from this development. A program which you don't need to debug, you don't need to test, you don't need to simulate. Okay, and this is just as simple as this. Then you have all the computational parts of your development. What matters if you want to introduce or add to a development functions that reason about these properties that I show. What language is that? Okay. It can also uh, usually well, not it's not usual. It uh, generates for OCaml, Haskell, and Scheme. You cannot generate directly to an imperative language, unfortunately, because the models are not the same. But there are guys which are working, for instance, in translating this immediately to C or to even for some particular transformations, uh, crazy transformations indeed. But you can, in fact, have this kind of stuff. It puts a lot of work, but you can do it. But if you want to learn a bit of functional programming, which would be good also for your work, believe me, you can develop everything in Cloud 10, extract it, and you have a uh, problem that works. And I can bet you all my money, which is not that much, but that you can operate this with actual inputs that uh, satisfies the specification. Okay? And this is mainly the point where I wanted to reach by, by giving you this, this presentation, is that you have several approaches to, to prove that your results are correct. One of them will automatically, but you have to sacrifice some properties because they are not decidable. The other way is to do it interactively. It will burn your brain. It will make you crazy, but in the end, it compensates. Okay? And essentially, I believe, well, I think it's that. Okay, thank you.
constraint programming and from SP. The challenge itself is to put it there, right? Then, okay, you have the solver and then you will find a, eventually you will have a solution. Mm -hmm. So, in which kind of, uh, for instance, you just explain this, mm -hmm. how to show like the algorithm is um, properly certain, yeah. right? So, obviously, then you can have another, uh, you say, verification. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So, you can do it by like, mm -hmm. hand, right? I think it will be faster than doing it this way. So in which kind of systems or in which kind of examples it pays off to put so much effort to go in this kind of formal verification? You see, um, yeah, I see. I see if the point. you have an algorithm, you use a quantum invariant, and then yes. you will... Like, like, I, like I told you, uh, the, the thing I did during my PhD, I could implement the, the program in one afternoon. It took me four hours to prove it. Academically, it's... Quite nice. Uh, you just pass four years, you enjoy you make publications, and in fact, you get you get the reward of no one can contest your your program. But yes, it's kind of a difficult uh, option when to go to this or just to do standard proof and papers. What I would say, and what is standard now, is people try to make a mix of systems. They do automatic proofing. Okay, if you are not able to prove everything, then you have to, to think: is the rest worthwhile trying to prove? Or not. If it is, then well, you have to go to one of the systems which complicate a lot of your life. Or you can go into monitoring and stuff like that. It's very hard for you to, to define what, what uh, is worthwhile or not. For instance, I can tell you, mathematicians in general, they don't think this is worthwhile doing. Because they think they are the best ones to improve. And they are not. They fail a lot. Okay? So, uh, for, for um, let's say, Real-time systems, you have now standards, the DO178C or so, that recommends using formal methods for the most safety-critical parts of the systems. Industry are doing it? I don't think so, because you need expert in training and it usually costs a lot. So it's, I cannot give you a true or false answer. It depends on your problem. Okay, and then just to finish the question, uh, my, another thing I would like to, if you can develop a bit mm -hmm. more, is like then, okay, fine. Then you have the requirements and you put like all the predicates and so on, and then you will eventually find the proof mm -hmm. based of a method that is, you show something about this SIT, right? Mm -hmm. So this SIT uh, in somehow is an NP hard problem. Right? Yes. So it's also maybe the case that, okay, you spend a lot of time, let's say, developing the, sure. the predicates, and then how I don't know, like an example you can say mm -hmm. in time, how much will take this to be solved and then to check if it's uh, satisfiable or not, right? Because, okay, in this example, yeah, fine, it was yes. extremely fast. Yes, as, well as, as you told, yes, the complexity, the worst case complexity, theoretical complexity is really high. But believe me, these guys are developing very intelligent uh, heuristics. Based on what I'm the next. So, but based on what, I mean, because then when Vincent was mentioning this thing of the simplex method, okay, it's like, okay, kind of, you have uh, a wall over there. But do you have any intuition or do you know, like, which kind of method they use to make this kind of solving, especially for this uh, okay. faster and more efficient, mm -hmm. I don't know, there are tricks over there. Yeah. First step, use an adequate programming language. Okay. Usually C++. Uh, next, I think that the methods they use pass very, very much through graph optimization problems. I'm not an expert on that, I cannot give you. I can give, point, give you the pointers for the books where they define all the strategies, okay? But usually it's that. You basically try to find conflicts within your demonstration so that you don't have to uh, analyze the complete spectrum of variables that are involved. Okay. Currently, you can analyze systems with millions of variables for you to see how far it goes. It doesn't apply to all cases, of course. If you think of model checking, it easily blows up because the problem itself is very complicated. But you have cases where it works really nice. For instance, one of the cases where SMT provers are being used is to prove uh, the correctness of um, uh, cryptographic algorithms, as they are becoming very good to reason about integer numbers and um, all the properties that they are involved in public key cryptography, for instance, when you have a um, division model and all this stuff. Okay? If you think about systems that have 
floating point uh, constructions over there, things get a big mess, a big mess, because it's much harder for us to reason on this, on this setting. And because when you do it, you usually don't get the most general result. You get the one bounded by the number of bits that you use. That's why they support the support the effect of theory. Okay? And this goes always around this, this same problem. You cannot um, guess how much it will cost, so you cannot make a full prediction on how it will be expensive to do a full verification of the system. And usually you don't want that. In fact, you just want that for that particular algorithm. And the rest can live as long as that algorithm doesn't fall. Okay? So this is the most. You know. But I can, give you, I can give you links to that. It's, uh, it's quite boring. One last question. Thanks, <laughs> I wanted to ask, I mean, you, you often say it as a joke, like uh, a lot of crazy people are doing crazy things with that, but um, computers are becoming more and more powerful, and I think a lot of people are taking this very seriously, yeah, yeah. lately. And um, maybe 10 years ago, people thought, OK, this is crazy, because the only thing you can prove is a very small equation. But today, it's not true anymore. Yeah, yeah. And I was looking at this, uh, there is a new microkernel called mm -hmm. Cell4. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. you, you know this? Uh, yeah, 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 I presented it in the beginning. Ah, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's one of uh, the great tools that I talked about. Uh, for my microkernel. Okay, then I have a question about that one actually. Yeah. So, I was reading that some weeks ago, and so now they went open source, okay, yeah. and they claim on the website is the word first operating system kernel with an end-to-end -end proof of implementation correctness and security enforcement. Okay, mm -hmm. So I checked a bit, and then they use this program called Isabel, That's which is a generic proof assistant. Yeah. It allows mathematical formulas to be expressed in a formal language and provide tools for proving those formulas in a logical calculus level. Yeah. So my question is like, okay, what does it mean in the common tongue to have like uh, an, op an operating system which is end-to-end -end Proof of implementation correctness. What what does it mean? What it means here is that it's bug free. No, I guess yeah, not. Yeah, bug free. Bug free. What the guys did, but I'm not sure if it's about. Well, it's not about the complete cell for kernel. It's a subset of it. For which, as far as I know, unless I'm right, for which they were able to design an abstract model. From there, from that design, they implemented an ASCII program, a functional program that gives exactly. That properties. Okay, from that uh, ASCO development, they translated to Isabel, which is essentially the same thing as code. They have different activities beneath, but they serve the same purposes to prove validity. Okay, once they did it, they extracted a functional program, a little bit like I show you here, but they extracted an ASCO, and then they re-implemented all of that. I don't know if it was. Using, I'm pretty sure they were working on making a translator from ASCII to C, and the translator itself was proved correct. So they used that extracted functional program and generated the SQL. So we have all the control software for the kernel itself proof bug free. Meaning that this doesn't have anything to do with the underlying hardware. You are doing proofs, assuming that the OR hardware will behave well. So what you are proving is that the semantic of the code is correct. Yes, yes, yes. And imagine, for instance, that you use this piece of work here. And if you use a certified compiler, the assembly code is generated is correct. And that it's according to yeah. what it is specified. Yes, yes, always, of course. Yeah. I mean, so for example, they say it's uh, they have some security properties proven. Mm -hmm. So they only have those security properties yes. proven. So you have, if you Maybe if you have a very smart attacker that remind, that mm -hmm. is able to make an attack that is based on something that they didn't yeah. remember, yeah. you can do it, right? Of course, of course. It's only you only have verification you have, if you have specification. Otherwise, forget it. So all so those that was that was a very catchy name, but what it means is okay. They have checked, for example, that there is no segmentation fault. Yes. I mean, you cannot expect that the operating system has not been implemented by a first grade student, so for sure you expect having no segmentation for it. But what about the bugs that they may not have thought about? Yes. Like, like, they because when you proof check, mm -hmm. you are actually 
chasing something very specific. Of course. Of course. Yes, it's so always the same problem. Can you have a specific case when you're wrong? Of course there is. Yeah. But that is your problem, not the shaker problem. The idea here is that we have tools that check that things are correct with respect to your specification. So you cannot have better than this, definitely. So what I'm trying to mm -hmm. do, like, what I'm thinking is, is it that much simpler to make a to make a to make a, a correct a correct specification than a correct program? It can be, depending on the cases, it can be as harder, can be the same hardness. I mean, because this would happen. Usually proofs are more difficult, but specifications, they can be as hard as proving itself. Because if the specification is highly detailed, then basically you are programming within the specification. Yeah. That's one of the things of when you use code. For instance, you have dependent types, meaning that you can say that you're talking about the race of length and when the, you don't have only the notion of array, you have the notion of families of arrays, where n is the particular size. So when you are reasoning about your array, you have to take in consideration what index you are, and if you are not, and by default you cannot go overflow, because you are always limited within the bounds imposed by the specification itself. Okay? Specification within of detail can always be can almost be programmed. I'm just wondering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If we are just replacing the mistakes by programmers by mistakes by mistakes by yes. I don't know what to call it. Requirements, yeah. yeah. Um, the thing is that we still didn't reach the point where we can make this kind of analysis. But if people tend to go more formal, then eventually you reach a point where you are replacing bad programming by bad specification. But if we we have but if we can just limit the critical stuff of our yeah. problem to small things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is the main goal of verification, is not to formalize a full complete system. That is not possible. It takes too much time, too much money, too much resources. So how many, how many PhDs or years these guys do to do to the to the this kind of learning? This one, I don't know. This I can say it's mostly one guy, which is definitely a genius. He have implemented compilers before and then just put them correct. This takes a team of, I think, 11 or 12 PhDs, top guys, to prove this five thumbs, which of course is a mathematical theory, but it really took a lot of time. And this is a forging project between three universities. Which one? The UK, Munich, and French yeah. people. Yes, yes, yes. yes. This one is only about French people, although it has Microsoft over there, but it is only people from Korea. And the first one was just for a guy. But this this is the one I know less about. I'm not that much concerned about this part, much about that part. But usually it takes big teams for, let's say, at least 10 guys, which is a big team for putting a theorem. And uh, very, very good guys, which themselves implemented theorem provers and stuff like that. So it's, it can be really hard, believe me. And I'm pretty sure the, this Gontier guy, which is really clever, but when you talk to him, you talk binary, you know, he says yes or no, he's not a social guy, he for sure will come up with another crazy proof in the, in the following years. This is the work of the guy, just wants to prove volumes of stuff. <clears throat> and a lot of people do it. There is this movement in the computer science is to show that the very fundamentals of mathematics are correct, that you didn't make an error in some specific kind of thing. And if you do it for mathematics, then eventually you can apply computer science engineering. Mm. So, I think 